Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Loot Crate. Awesome monthly geek and gamer gear delivered right to your door. A themed mystery crate that's loaded with surprises, collectibles, t-shirts, vinyl action figures, mugs, anime stuff, licensed gear. I mean, everything from Star Trek to Hunger Games to Suicide Squad to Deadpool to Mario Brothers to The Walking Dead. Way too much to include everything here. You have to go to the website and check it out, and I'll give you the domain here in just a second. Right now, they're even offering limited edition Star Wars and Call of Duty crates. You can just pick up separately. Six to eight items in every box for less than 20 bucks a month. And the Loot Crate theme for April is Quest which means your crate will include exclusive items from Labyrinth, Harry Potter, History Channel's Vikings, and Uncharted 4. Now, if you're listening in archive and April 2016 has passed, you can log on and check out the theme for your particular month. The deadline to sign up for each month's theme is April the 19th, 9 p.m. Pacific. Sign up for a month, sign up for a year. Whatever, no long-term commitment. You can cancel whenever you want. $3 off any new subscription, but you need to use my name in the website. It is a great and geek way to support this broadcast. So thank you and check it out. Sign up today at lootcrate.com slash Seth Andrews. That's lootcrate.com slash Seth Andrews. I have to put the disclaimer out again because I've received quite a few emails about part one of our homeschooling cults broadcast. And I said in the actual broadcast, verbally, and I had it written in the description box, this is not a referendum on all homeschools for talking about the extreme cases. But it's a sensitive subject, I understand, and many people who are part of homeschooling environments that are not extreme. They're not fundamentalist religious brainwashing centers. These people were desperate for me to reinforce again that I'm not condemning all homeschools. I'm not saying that all homeschools are cults. We are speaking about homeschools that exist to isolate and insulate and indoctrinate. These pods, these cocoons, which aren't designed to focus education in a way that actually genuinely benefits the child, but it exists to cordon the child off from other ideas and to feed them constantly bad ideas. That's what today's broadcast is about, okay? So again, there it is, stated out loud and for the record. I had a few people who said not all religious homeschools are cults. Now, I don't like to use the word all when talking about anything, really. I will say I'm a little less likely to give latitude to religious homeschool environments. I'm surrounded by friends and family who religiously homeschool their kids. And I'll tell you that I don't know any one. They may exist out there somewhere, but I don't know one who isn't religiously homeschooling their child because they're terrified of the world and they think public schools are just a petri dish of evolutionism and Satan running rampant in the hearts and minds of a generation and everybody's doing drugs and having sex and you know, all oh, the state of the world today, we have to protect our children. We must provide a godly educational environment for them, hence the Christian or religious homeschool. The reason they are educating them in a religious school, at home or otherwise, is because they do want to shape what they think, why they think it, how they think it. They want to create echoes of themselves. They want to make little champions of their own particular theological worldview, their own religious doctrine, their own God, their own holy book, their own faith. They want to create more of what they already think, and that's why these religious homeschools exist. Now, there may be examples of religious homeschooling where they don't care all that much about the religion part. They may exist. I'll give you that. I haven't seen it anywhere. I received correspondence from advocates of secular homeschools who've had great success, and they wanted me to reinforce that. 
that homeschooling for them has been a positive thing. It doesn't exist to indoctrinate, but to focus education in a way that's really good for this particular child or these children, and it's worked for them. So I'll throw that out and make sure everybody knows about it. It ain't about all homeschools, but there is an entire culture of faith-based homeschooling that is genuinely damaging young children. That's what our broadcast here is about. I had messages from people who had no idea this stuff was going on. They heard part one last week and they were like, you got to be kidding me. I didn't even realize this was happening. That's why this show exists, to reveal and expose the kind of stuff that these poor kids are going through right now and the mountain they have to climb to escape and enter the real world. Okay? The great majority of our anecdotes and stories and examples from fundamentalist homeschool cults deal with Christ and Christianity based around the Bible. But our first story on tonight's show actually starts with an Islamic family. Here's an email from Mina. She said this, I was raised in a strict Islamic home where I was homeschooled until I was 11 years old. Homeschooling didn't just mean being schooled at home. We had an Islamic school and other Muslims' houses my mother would take us to. The only thing we learned at home was Arabic and the sutras of the Quran, also how to be obedient little Muslim girls. The Islamic school experience was insane. I don't think many people know this, but there is so much fear in Islam. Not just fear of violence and the harmful dogmas, but fear of jinn and the shaitan. Jinn are evil spirits, and the shaitan is the devil. I remember that everyone, including the principal of the school and the imam of the mosque, would convince us children that the school was being watched by these evil spirits, and always that they were there to try to sway us from the faith. The school was often vandalized, and actual spooky things would happen— of course, I know now that it was fear tactics, but I remember being terrified. We never learned anything that ever would have benefited us in life. It was all about fear and obedience. The other thing, too, was how differently the girls were treated. Boys would never get into trouble for harassing us, even for doing sexually suggestive things. I also remember my mother telling us that we could never sleep on our stomachs. Because if we did, the shaitan would have sex with us. Once we moved to Washington State from Texas, my parents got even stricter with the homeschooling. They let us go to small public school for a few months until they found out that we were taking our hijabs off. Then they pulled us from that school and started homeschooling again. This was just sad. Both my parents worked, my brother was allowed to go to public high school, but my sister and I had to be homeschooled. We literally did nothing all day. My mother gave us Arabic books and the Quran to read. Instead, we would play dress-up and wait outside for the kids to get out of school and off the bus in our neighborhood so we could talk to them from standing on the fence. We longed for any human interaction outside of the family and mosque, this went on for a year. There was an earthquake one morning when my sister and I were home alone. We were frightened, and in a few split seconds, we came up with a crazy idea to convince our parents why we should be in school. This story became a manifestation of complete fear for us. We began to believe it actually happened. Our mother came home to two terrified, screaming and crying daughters, who were upstairs, huddled together in a corner. We told her that a djinn was in the downstairs bathroom, and it was shrieking at us. We even knocked some things down through the hallway to make it look like we'd ran from it, up the stairs. How we got ourselves into this panic, crying state still surprises me today. It was like we just went into a strange character, and we convinced ourselves that it really happened. My parents believed it. My mother said because of the earthquake that the jinn must have emerged from the shaken earth. We used to stack pillows up at the closed bathroom door and actually be afraid of going in there. A short time afterwards, my parents put us back in public school. Crazy stuff. It's insane to recall these things. I have so many memories of things in my childhood that just seem too ridiculous to be true. 
It's made me into a stronger person and a mother who knows what not to do to my own daughter. Mina, thanks so much for sharing your story. Greatly appreciated. Ashley Feinberg has done a series of articles that posted in the summer of last year about the homeschool curriculum that was used by the Duggar family. You know, the quiverful family, the evangelical Christian family who had the 19 children. In fact, they were stars of a TLC television show, 19 kids and counting, nine daughters, 10 sons, all the kids' names starting with the letter J. And they homeschool all their children. Josh Duggar, the eldest son, of course, revealed last summer as being a child molester. But uh, Feinberg's article really gets specifically into how these kids were homeschooled and the crazy shit they were taught. And she posts examples, but let me set it up here real fast, okay? Reading from the article. You've seen some examples of the dangerous backwards logic that helped fuel that systematic and highly preventable sexual abuse, and some explorations of the culture of authority and fear promulgated by the Duggars' uniquely patriarchal brand of Christianity. But we've still just barely scratched the surface of the insane, terrifying homeschool cult that the Duggars and millions more across the country subscribe to. The bizarre horrors of the Advanced Training Institute, ATI, its founder Bill Gothard, and its many overpopulated families would take days to work through. Here's what we're dealing with. First, what is ATI? ATI is a biblically-based homeschooling program that lets Christian families integrate their kids daily hours-long moral learnings with just a dash of secularism. Its various pillars include doing exactly what's expected, quote, instantly and cheerfully, not asking questions, strict adherence to patriarchal standards, and, of course, shielding yourselves from any influence or human that might lead you off the beaten path. The home education program is just one of many bizarre offshoots of the Institute in Basic Life Principles, a group, quote, dedicated to giving clear instruction and training on how to find success by following God's principles found in Scripture. Or rather, they're dedicated assuming you buy its expansive back catalog or pay to attend one of its seminars, education programs, camps, youth academies, training sessions, what have you. The ATI program itself, though, is made up of a series of wisdom booklets and optional supplementary packets that theoretically could make up the entirety of any good, righteous child's education. So who is Bill Gothard? The article continues. As the single 80-year-old founder of IBLP, the Institute for Basic Life Principles, so he must be 81 at least now since the article is older. Bill Gothard is the center of any ATI devotee's universe. He's currently on indefinite administrative leave after it got out that at least 34 women had come forward with claims of sexual harassment, for which he has remained unincarcerated and unpunished. Gothard's biggest days are behind him. In the 70s and 80s, the evangelical masses would pour into auditoriums by the tens of thousands to hear him speak. This despite the fact that in 1980, his brother Steve Gothard was charged with a major sex scandal in addition to money laundering and was ultimately forced to step down. Gothard supposedly knew about the illicit activity and turned a blind eye, which led to him resigning as head for a grand total of three weeks. Despite, or perhaps because of, Gothard's strict gender hierarchy, he seems doomed to be an eternal philandering millionaire bachelor. IBLP is currently helping, quote, reconcile his sin, but his teachings remain fully endorsed. So what does ATI believe? Put simply, whatever Bill Gothard tells them to believe. The lessons themselves consist of bizarre, forced attempts at inserting some type of traditional education into biblical passages, which is where you get questions such as, how did the Socratic method of reasoning come from a sodomite manner of living? How can graphs help to visualize the consequences of lust? 
And how do prime numbers illustrate the principle of one flesh in marriage? Now, she has posted a wisdom worksheet on Matthew chapter 5. And I'll just read a couple of these short sections for you. I'll just read them verbatim, okay? Under history, how were great civilizations destroyed through lust? Archaeology confirms that great and highly developed civilizations once thrived in various parts of the world. Today, their descendants live in poverty, disease, and ignorance. They are not primitive. They are decadents who are experiencing the consequences of of lustful passions. And the example shown is that of the Mayans who turned to idols after their once great achievements in astronomy and architecture. Other examples of ATI wisdom booklet training information. What's the best way for women to decrease their chances of cancer and venereal disease? Doctors have discovered that the seed of the man is an alien substance to the woman. It triggered responses similar to those of an allergic reaction. A woman who has a husband is able to develop immunity to this reaction. However, a promiscuous woman's immune system becomes confused and unable to distinguish alien substances. This confusion is a key to the development of cancer. The workbooks use gangrene to illustrate the development and the destruction of lust. Gangrene, or lust, requires complete amputation, separation, of an infected member, which is the source of evil before a wound can heal. Diseases of the body usually have their counterpart in diseases of the soul. There is, in fact, an intimate relationship between the health of the soul and the health of the body. By understanding the workings of a disease in one realm, we can often gain significant insight into a corresponding disease in the other realm. How does a father damage his sons and daughters by lust? In the same way as genetic diseases are passed from parents to children, the specific sins of the fathers are passed on in the form of weaknesses to their sons and daughters. Thus, a father who lusts with his eyes will cause his children to have greater temptation in this area until he confesses his past sins and prays a daily hedge around his children. How might sin and its guilt contribute to physical afflictions in women? Many surgeries are performed to correct conditions which can be traced directly or indirectly to sin and guilt. The miscarriage or premature birth of a child conceived in unfaithfulness can also be attributed to the stress of the cup of bitter water. This interpretation assumes that the accused woman is pregnant when she is brought before the priest. If the child is the husband's, she has no reason for guilt and the child will live. Terrifying stuff. Nick Ducote, who is writing for Homeschoolers Anonymous, I'm speaking with Nick here on the radio in just a few, but he sort of went a little further down the rabbit hole in regard to the Advanced Training Institute wisdom booklets in regard to sex, much of this stuff targeted again to females, often blaming females for things like sex crime. If not outright, the implication is certainly there based in the words of Scripture. Nick wrote that a foundational point in ATI and Gothard's sexual ethic is a lack of agency for men and women as a powerful temptation. Women were saddled with the majority of responsibility for men's lustful thoughts. Gothard's characterization of women meant that their immodesty compelled men to sexualize, harass, or assault them. One of Gothard's big things was for families to have Bible time in the mornings, which consisted of reading a proverb each day of the month, then a handful of Psalms. Proverb 7, King James Version, was always emphasized by my parents, and it describes a young man being tempted and literally led down a dark alley to have sex with a woman of the night. The woman is described as wearing, quote, the attire of a harlot. 
Her participation in the public sphere is key to her function as a temptation, and, quote, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. The chapter constantly emphasizes the woman catching the man, convincing him to, quote, take our fill of love with her fair speech. Despite the highly sensual details provided by the author, the consequences of participating in such actions are clear. Quote, he goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter. Many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. The message of Proverbs 7 is echoed by ATI's Wisdom Booklet 24, which focuses on lust, temptation, and provided the basics for sexual education for thousands of ATI students. And he includes a full copy of the volume at the bottom of his blog, and I'll link to Homeschoolers Anonymous in the description box of this show. Wisdom Booklet 24 focused on Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, which reads, Ye have heard it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. From the Wisdom Booklet, lust has the capability of conquering any man. Lust conquered the strongest man who ever lived, Samson. Lust drew away the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon. Lust defiled a man after God's own heart, David. Immorality is entirely defined by Scripture verses and does not address things like consent or marital rape. The Wisdom Booklet's history resource profiled Hitler, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Karl Marx, and Nietzsche. You guessed it, each one of these people were characterized by how their immorality led them astray or ended up with genocide. And they get back again into the traps. The Science Resource chapter emphasizes the role of women as active trappers. Trappers lure animals into their traps with tempting sights, sounds, and scents. And the chapter goes on to talk about nakedness and modesty in the home and modesty among women and venereal diseases. Venereal diseases are transmitted primarily by a corruption of God's design for love. When man violates God's design for marriage and follows his own lustful desires, he suffers grave consequences to his own health. Nick Ducote's article says this, In my many conversations with ATI survivors, sexual abuse is too often a topic of discussion. One woman I talked with was abused as a child, and her family not only blamed her for it, but held exorcisms. They convinced her the demons inside her were making men abuse her. Agency and responsibility are replaced by pseudoscience and utterly incomprehensible logic about sex and sexual desire. Gothard used this system to groom his victims, to shame them into silence, to make them afraid to speak up. Why? Because they might have been responsible for the abuse. And this, of course, just the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to speak more with Nick Ducote of Homeschoolers Anonymous in just a few. I've got MRV on Skype. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. What's your name? Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Were you a homeschooled student? Yes, I was. You want to talk about it? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> just treat me like your bartender. All right. We're all sitting down. You're just going to unload. Well, uh, no, I'm serious. Because I'm not familiar with a bartender. Uh... <laughs> you didn't have, you've never imbibed. You were probably taught as a homeschool student about the evils of alcohol, weren't you? Absolutely. Do not get drunk with wine, that type of stuff. Of course, the Bible also talks about Jesus turning water into wine. I never really understood that discrepancy. So, Well, you know, what we were taught is that it, was, it wasn't really fermented to the extent that we do today. It was more like grape juice, you know. It was grape juice. In fact, actually, one of the things I got in trouble with after I had left home was I used a cookbook with my younger sister, and my mom thought I was teaching her to drink wine because it taught you which glasses were water and which were wine glasses at the table. This just sounds like prison. 
Michelle, that, you know? It was. <laughs> All right. Paint the picture for me. I mean, what are we talking about? For those who've never experienced it, we're hearing different personal experience stories about those who've been through this particular gauntlet. Give me a snapshot of yours. What was it like? As a young child, it was fun and it was getting up in the morning and doing schoolwork for like two hours or so and then having the rest of the day to play, hang out, enjoy the yard, whatever. But we were raised, obviously, very fundamentalist Christians. And my mom tried to replicate a private Christian school. So in the morning, we began on time at nine o'clock. We said the Pledge of Allegiance. We did a family devotions time. We read through the Bible. Then we moved on to math at a set time, like clockwork. We had a set time for lunch. We had a chalkboard on the wall. She basically wanted to send me and my brother to private school, but couldn't afford it. So she tried to replicate that in our home. And my mom, as far as a teacher goes in elementary, she was really good. She was on top of things. She changed out the curriculum if it seemed like I wasn't understanding. But again, there was mostly an emphasis on living as a good Christian and heavy Bible indoctrination. Everything we did was to please God. And that had, you know, at the age of four, I remember being terrified of going to hell. And uh, every night I would pray that Jesus would really be in my heart because I never felt anything. And I was just terrified. And I grew up with this fear that I wasn't going to be a good Christian and that I wasn't going to make it. And everything we did in homeschool, we came to the perspective that public school students obviously, you know, didn't know anything about God. But even the private school wasn't quite good enough, wasn't holy enough as what we were doing, because you never know who could be sending their kids there, you know. Were you socialized, Michelle? Did they get you out and interact with other kids or one? Like we joined co-ops, which were at that point in time, there wasn't as many homeschool co-ops around. We used to drive like 45 minutes to go to one. And All right, describe a co-op. I'm sorry. Forgive me, Michelle. Describe a oh. co-op for our listeners. What is that? Okay. Well, so a co-op would be a bunch of homeschool families that were getting together generally like once a week or more often for different academic pursuits. So it would be like we had I'm a class on like teaching sign language or another mom tried to teach a class on um, biology or whatever. We would do things like that in an attempt to give that social aspect. But again, we were only socializing with people who were just like us. We weren't spending time going out into the world. We made sure that we were only socializing with other homeschool children. Do you remember that the name of the actual curriculum you guys went through? Yes. Actually, my mom went through a variety of materials because there are some like a Becca, which create um, comprehensive packages for homeschool parents to make it simple and easy. A Becca is put out by Pensacola Christian College in Florida. They also um, had a video curriculum, which we couldn't afford. We used some of the material. We used things from the Hewitt Moore Foundation. We'd never used anything from Bob Jones University Press. My mom didn't like them. There, she believed they weren't like really academic. She would use a few public school hand me downs, like, you know, like at yard sales and stuff like that, as if it was literature or anything not related to science. I'm trying to think. We used uh, Saxon for math, that's really big at my homeschoolers, Apologia for science. So you were part of this sort of homeschool microcosm. I mean, you guys are your own little ecosystem where right. you're never really introduced to anyone or anything outside of this particular set of circles. Is that correct? Are you in the pod, Michelle? <laughs> Definitely in the pod. I mean, I was fortunate in that my mom did let me roam the neighborhood. So I did have a friend next door <laughs> and, you know, we'd occasionally like ride our bikes and hang out with people that she was friends with from school. But I mean, it was like one person who lived next door. Um, mm. It wasn't. Michelle, was there anything that sticks out that was kind of weird that you were taught that now you think I can see it, but back then it was normal? Is there anything that you think this actually was harmful or just stupid that they were teaching as fact in your homeschool environment? <laughs> well, that's kind of like a list. Um, well, give me part of the list, you know, so, if, if you're comfortable doing so. I mean, you tell me. Okay, well. Uh, if you want me to start with um, like academic, obviously we were taught that God created the world 6,000 years ago. There's the whole creation package, which I no longer believe to be in any way reasonable. Um, we 
had a heavy emphasis on the end times and how God was going to rapture his church. And so I spent much of my teen years not anticipating adulthood, believing that I wasn't going to make it to adulthood because Jesus was going to come back. So how did you feel about the rapture? Were you scared of it or were you excited about it? I'm going to heaven kind of thing. Part of me was terrified because I was like, well, maybe I'll never get to grow up. Maybe I'll miss it. Maybe I'm not living right and I'll be left behind. What if we don't have our eschatology quite right and we're going to go through the tribulation first? So there was a lot of fear there. And then on the other hand, I was very lonely, very isolated. And I spent a lot of my time just kind of depressed in my room and not realizing that it was depression because, hey, we have the joy of the Lord, right? We have the fruits of the spirit. I didn't know what depression was was, I thought, well, gosh, if I feel this bad, how does the world feel? They must really have it that. So I actually look forward to the rapture as an end to my miserable life in many ways. It's kind of this one-two punch of depression and isolation, which probably feed off of each other. I had had that one friend who was my neighbor. We moved and she moved away. And after that, I never made another close friend. And I spent all of my time taking care of my three younger brothers and my sister. And just kind of focused on that as like a ministry to God and tried to fellowship with people in the church. We had moved to a smaller church where there weren't many others my age. And even when there were people my age, I was weird among the weird. Like you're going to a Pentecostal church, praying in tongues, prophesying, and yet you still don't fit in because you're the only one who is an awkward homeschooler who doesn't really know how to relate to anybody else. I don't want you to take this question yeah. wrong. If I may use sort of church language, I'm I'm saying this in love, right? <laughs> so bless your heart and, and whatnot. No, when you graduated, were you screwed up? You know, when <laughs> you, I, I don't know how else to say it. You know, you exist in this cocoon, you graduate. Hello, here's the real world. Then what happens? Well, what happens is you go nowhere. You stay home waiting for God to bring something into your life. Because as a woman, I believe my place was in the home that I was supposed to get married and have children and raise them to worship God if he hadn't raptured me before that happened. And so after I graduated, I was just teaching my youngest brother how to read. I was making dinner three, four nights a week. I was making breakfast, lunch, cleaning house. I was living the life of a housewife at the age of 19 and 20 without actually having a family of my own. I was just being a sister mom. And as much as my mom was a preacher and she believed that women could share the gospel, she also believed that at the same time she was submitting to the authority of my father, much like Joyce Meyer says that she submits to the authority of her husband when she goes out and preaches. My mom had a similar kind of perspective. And I was just waiting for the right guy to come along and propose so I could get out of there. I didn't You're waiting for someone to come along and tell you or guide you into the life that you will then live after that. Yes. It's a very long, crazy story. My husband and I courted and met and got married. But when we finally did set up on our own, I was so afraid of everything because I had been raised my whole life to believe that the world was out to get me. That, you know, just calling up the electric company to try and pay the bill. I was afraid they were going to yell at me on the phone. I was afraid if I paid a day late, I was going to get start getting notices. Every little thing I did as an adult was like the nervousness that you feel going out on your own was just magnified and amplified because I didn't think there were good people out there. I thought everyone out there was just so messed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did you yourself get out of this sort of cycle? Slow and gradual. I was afraid to drive. I had my driver's license, but I didn't really go anywhere. Didn't really meet anybody. But after I had my first child, I tried going to a mom's group. And the people in the mom's group, you know, um, my mom said that they were all new age because they believed in things like co-sleeping and breastfeeding. And she was like, well, that's a new age kind of group. But I went anyway. And I felt trapped in my home. So I decided to take up a martial arts class. And my mom called me up and was like, your baby's going to become possessed because you take him there. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm going here. This feels good. I'm actually getting out. And, and the martial arts really helped me to confront my fear of men 
because I was the only girl in the class and I was constantly grappling and trying to, you know, throw these big men around the mat. And I was just afraid to like talk to people. And in church, you know, we always did that little like awkward side hug thing. Yeah. So, you know, here I was trying to get like pinned on the mat. It was, that helped me to break out and to realize I could converse with people that weren't from my church. I could be in close quarters with people and be safe and okay. Probably a confidence builder to be able to, you know, go through a series of achievements and yeah. You know. um, so as much as my mom believed my baby would become possessed, he was an angel, <laughs> and yeah. he always sat and slept quietly for me while I went there, and that was, I think, um, monumental for me in getting out of that mode. And just from then on, it's kind of it's my kids have brought me out into meeting other people and doing things. And I've always been, you know, an avid reader. So uh, I read many apologetics books, you know, by John Stott, Ravi Zacharias, Josh McDowell, Ugh. Norman Geisler. Um, but I was never satisfied. I always was like, I could always think of an argument that was better. So that kind of started leading me on the way out of my belief system into a more progressive Christianity first. Did you come to a point where you walked away from the faith altogether? Or are you still a, some kind of Christian oh, or what? Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely no longer in the faith. I one day realized that all my life I had had these questions about, well, why did God allow this in the Bible or why this, why that? Because I had read the Bible through four times and I'd come across so many things that disturbed me deeply, especially as a child. If you're reading stories of like rape and murder and incest as, a, as you know, a 10 year old, it was traumatizing. And my mom was always like, well, you know, the Lord has a plan or God knows best. And then finally, one day I realized this just does not make any sense. It's so contradictory. How did I ever believe it? And um, I don't know. It was just over. <laughs> hey, Michelle, how does this affect how you've raised your own children? How has your past informed well, their future? Well, <laughs> I was raised in a household that believed in a very controlling, authoritative parenting. So my mom would employ, like, cry it out with the babies, you know, put them in the crib at night, and that's that. Um, she would spank us for small infractions, that you know, mistakes. And so when I had my son, I believed that was what you were supposed to do, but I couldn't actually bring myself to do that. And I began parenting him completely the opposite of how I'd been raised, because I remembered what it felt like when I was a toddler. I remembered what it felt like to be afraid and not know why I was getting spanked. And I remember the shame that I felt and I, I couldn't hit my kid. Um, and I could, I could try to control or dictate anything he did. I just was in awe of his creativity and his growth. And I started reading and trying to look into um, what's a different parenting style. I read Christian books on peaceful parenting. And from there, I kind of went into realizing that children aren't born sinful and warped, but that they're beautiful and intelligent and they need to just be guided. So I'm, I'm not a punitive parent. I believe in holding healthy boundaries and guiding them. I don't believe in harsh discipline, which is something my mom had advocated and taught other young women to do. And that I see is definitely a reaction to how I had, I, I had been raised because I, as I still clearly remember how I felt. It's inspiring though, to hear that, you know, you've, not gotten locked in that cycle, but you've sort of changed the game. You, I'm guessing, have now an environment where you foster discovery and curiosity and questions and, you know, go out yeah. and be who you are kind of thing. Yeah. For with my boys talk to me all the time about things like, well, you know, grandma says, you know, that Jesus made the world. It's like, that can't be true, can it? And we have all of these deep questions that kids love to ask. And I encourage them to, think for themselves and try to see, well, what do you think? Do you think that Jesus made the world? Well, what is Jesus? Like, okay, I try to explain who people say that Jesus is or was. And some people say that, you know, he really lives. Some people say that he's just a myth. And what do you guys think? And maybe, you know, obviously the grandparents talk to them about it. Well, the difference uh, is though, grandpa and grandma are teaching, trying to teach them what to think. You're trying to teach them how to think. Huge exactly. difference. Yes, I want them to think for themselves. Like one night, my eldest had said to me, he's like, you know, that Noah's Ark flood story, I don't think that could have really happened. <laughs> well, he's already ahead of Ken Ham, so good for him. 
you know? Good and I was like, him. you know, I, I, I agree with you there. Why do you say that? And he's like, well, you know, I mean, how would the animals fit in, in the whole world? And he started detailing all these reasons why he didn't think it made any sense. And at the time, he was six years old. Um, wow. You know, he's eight now and obviously the, still questioning. And, and that thrills me because I know when I was young and I asked questions like, well, if God can forgive anyone, how come he doesn't forgive Satan? You know, getting that kind of curiosity squash and being told, well, you can't be kinder than God, you know. Amazing what happens when you allow yourself to learn from more than just one book. You know, your whole world opens up. Thanks for sharing your story with us, Michelle. And um, I'm guessing with all that karate that if, you know, if anybody was to come and try to tell you that you're raising your kids wrong, you could just kick their ass, right? I mean, just... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could have a fly. <laughs> Some of the spin kick move and, you know, conversation over. So don't mess with Michelle. I'm excited for you. I'm excited for your family. Thanks for sort of giving us a window into this life and all my best for you and your future. Okay. All right. Thank you. Nick Ducote is a board member with Homeschool Alumni Reaching Out and is involved as well with Homeschoolers Anonymous. And we're going to get into these organizations and how they relate to each other. And I've asked uh, Nick to join me for just a few minutes to talk about this. Nick, thanks for being here, man. Great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Seth. So you yourself came out of a, a homeschool environment? Yes, from kindergarten through high school. Christian homeschooling and then conservative Christian homeschooling until we landed in ATI. The wisdom books were the curriculum, basically. In, in each volume, there are like 52 volumes. Each one would talk a little bit about medicine and science and law and uh, linguistics, and we always learned Greek words. So some of the science, as I read back through it, because someone actually got a hold of some of the, uh, the first run, the first press that they did of the wisdom books back in the early 80s, and that was the ones that I had growing up. And just some of, like, the reproductive science, um, some of the science on cancer, you know, um, the idea that cancer and a lot of illnesses are basically just God punishing you. So kind of just laying this constant misunderstanding of history, of science, and then using that to inform a fundamentalist spiritual view. So it's kind of this totalistic, you know, uh, for someone who, you know, obviously has no other reference point, it seems like education. It seems like, yeah, I'm learning subjects. I'm learning about different subjects. I'm learning about science. And it's not until you get out and you look back that you can really have the perspective just to wonder where did the, he even get these things? You know, I've said that it's, it seems like he took a, like a grade-level science book, took a, an occasional paragraph here and there, and then the rest of it is just almost like drug-fueled nonsense. I mean, it's just completely nonsensical. Gothard and ATI, this is the same homeschool sort of curriculum that the Duggars used for their family. Yep, exactly. I wrote a blog post back in May of last year, right after all the Josh Duggar stuff came out. I looked up kind of what I remember as the sex ed wisdom book, uh, the closest thing we got to learning anything about reproduction. And some of the quotes, uh, like this was the, the summary of the medicine section in wisdom book 24. How does lusting after a woman create hormonal imbalance in a man's body? When a man looks lustfully at a woman, a flood of impulses travel through the optic nerve to the back of the brain. As a result, the glands and other bodily functions are activated, and the level of testosterone increases. Recent studies revealed a significant correlation between high testosterone levels and those who commit violent crimes. Studies also reveal that visualizing an act three times leaves the same impact on our nervous system as actually doing it one time. And of course, young skulls who have been isolated from, you know, real education about sexuality and sexual identity and biology and all those things, they're probably just wide-eyed and lapping all this stuff up, huh? Yeah, you know, because the first half of it is some some basic, you know, arousal mechanics of hormones and arousal and, you know, is not a, necessarily a terrible description, but then to just make all these inferences off of it, you know, and then it kind of jumps, and that, that's how I was kind of describing it, jump from basic science to now there's these spiritual implications. 
and now you need to learn all about lusting and how it's awful and how it's basically if you lust you've not only committed you've committed crimes you know and then they just kind of layer all these terrible things that you know even just thinking about something Recovering Grace is a site that's run by former followers of Bill Gothard and uh, they released some lessons and different pieces of information from the teachings of ATI and Gothard's group related to homeschooling. They have a one sheet about counseling sexual abuse and it starts with a graph and in the middle of the graph it shows the circle and there's your spirit and after your spirit, your mind, your will and emotions. This is common language in the church. Why did God let it happen? Options include immodest dress, indecent exposure, being out from protection of our parents, being with evil friends, question mark. Mm -hmm. Is there any guilt for disobedience, for not reporting it? Clear guilt by confessing it to God. Explain the potential of a moral vaccination and a test of genuine love by, quote, casting out fear for marriage. If the abuse was not at fault, God compensated physical abuse with spiritual power. What is being mighty in spirit? What does it mean? Greater faith, spiritual discernment, genuine love, blah, blah, blah. And let's see. If you had to choose no physical abuse or being mighty in spirit, what would you choose? Are they implying that it was actually, at the end of the day, a positive because God used evil for good? Because that's sure what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the teaching right there. I mean, I think the kind of the philosophy behind it is a philosophy on suffering. And that if you conduct yourself in the right way, in the right manner, you know, parentheses, godly manner, godly way, as defined by Bill Gothard and H-E-I, in parentheses, then you can take a bad situation and you'll come out of it just awesome. You know, you'll come out of it having learned lessons. You'll be closer to God. And that's kind of some things that Mike Huckabee even mentioned in the, the aftermath of the Duggar scandal that everybody just kind of raised their eyebrows at, you know, that someone could even conceptualize it in that way. But there's a proverb pretty sure about uh, refining silver and uh, separating the good silver from the dross. And so that's the that's kind of the analogy is the idea of this fire refining you as a Christian and making you a better Christian. So then, if you don't react properly to your abuse, then people in the church can say, "Oh well, you're not treating this properly, and you're not acting properly." Be a good victim, basically, is how that dynamic plays out. I'm reminded of that scripture in Matthew. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, right? Uh, they can damage us physically, but at the end, it's the spirit that's the most important. This is kind of the mentality that often permeates many of these environments. Tell me about Harrow, the homeschool alumni reaching out, and Homeschoolers Anonymous. Tell me what you're doing now to help people who've sort of run this gauntlet and who are affected as children by these homeschool cults, would you? Sure. You even just looking at these stories and all these experiences, you see a pattern. You know, you see kind of a base foundational pattern, and then you see different shades. You see slightly different things here and there. And Ryan Stoller and I started the blog. That was the beginning. You know, we just wanted to tell the stories. We wanted to get it out there because there had been such a culture of silence, you know, surrounding these things. Because if you speak ill of your family, you're speaking ill of homeschooling. There's the, the idea in homeschooling that uh, Christian homeschooling, especially that it's under threat from the government. You know, you don't want to bring that sort of attention to your family or even to the culture and to the movement of the whole. So we just wanted to throw all that aside and just tell people's stories and tell people's experiences. And from that, we've just come across so many more people each time we sort of amplify that message. You know, it gets picked up in you know various media outlets, and new people see it for the first time. It's very validating for other survivors to see their stories covered by the media because for so long the coverage of homeschooling was just completely positive. And we're not anti-homeschooling, which is what, what a lot of people think. Kind of our basic message is we want to renew homeschooling from within. So we're not tearing anything down, we're not destroying anything, but we're the fruit of the movement, and we think that people should listen to our experiences and our stories and try to make a movement 
that is more child focused and parent focused and to actually emphasize things like the rights of children rather than seeing them merely as a chattel extension of a father. So that, that kind of initial stories and, and airing of what a lot of people call, you know, negative stories about homeschooling bridged into starting a nonprofit homeschool alumni reaching out where we're actually trying to create curriculum and materials for homeschool groups, for co-ops, on sex education, on suicide prevention, on child abuse awareness, and you know what to do when you see child abuse in your homeschool group. We have a, a kind of a team of mental health professionals, and you know whatever kind of area we're working in, we try to get some voices from the field to try to make this next generation of homeschooling not so riddled with abuse, with cover-ups of abuse, with silence. You know, there's no reason for that. Nick, thanks to you and everybody who's involved over there for what you do. And I'll make sure again to include that link. And thanks for being a part of the broadcast. It means a lot. Yeah, thanks, Seth. I want to finish the broadcast tonight with the audio from a conversation that I had with Vicki Garrison. Kind of a happy ending. You know, we've dealt with some pretty dark material, especially as we get into just the damage done to these kids. And I wanted to finish with a story of someone who had experienced it firsthand, but also who escaped and is now helping others. And I've had Vicki Garrison on the radio before. I've got a video of this exchange between us. It's about a 11, 12 minute piece. She talks briefly about her own immersion in a homeschool cult and the quiverful movement, how it pretty much ruined her life and was ruining her kids, and how she escaped and how she is helping other people. In fact, she was awarded the, I think it was the 2013 American Atheist, Atheist of the Year Award, and she runs the No Longer Quivering blog, and it's just an awesome, happy ending to her story. You'll notice from time to time there's kind of a musical interlude of a few seconds with nobody speaking. That's because in the video version there are on-screen titles that kind of help propel the story. But I think it translates just fine to radio, and it's what I want to leave you with tonight. Vicki Garrison and No Longer Quivering. And thanks for listening. The Quiverful Movement is based on the premise, from it, which comes from Psalm 127.3, uh, children are a blessing from the Lord. The fr fruit of the womb is His reward. And it goes on and says, Like arrows in the hands of a mighty man, so are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. And so the basic idea is that children are an unmitigated blessing from God and that you should be open to receiving as many blessings as God wants to send your way. Definitely a very strong emphasis on patriarchy. The man is the head of the household. The woman is there as a helpmeet. She's there to uh, serve her husband and, and help him to accomplish whatever vision it is that God has given him as a, a mission for his family. In my own life, I have some health issues which made um, pregnancy very difficult for me and so uh, after our third was born I said I just can't do this anymore and the doctor said you really shouldn't do this anymore and so my husband went and had a vasectomy and we were done and it wasn't until after that that I really encountered a lot of the, the quiverful teaching and I started feeling you know really guilty like I had done um, just a, a horrible thing kind of usurping God's position as the giver or creator of life. Like I had taken that out of his hands into my own. I do not regret having my kids. They are, they are wonderful. They're absolutely a joy. Um, but yeah, it took a lot out of me. It was a very difficult, very demanding and harsh lifestyle to just to try and keep up with. And I didn't keep up with it nearly to the degree that, you know, it would be healthy or functional in our home. I just, everything was falling to pieces because I couldn't, there were times where I just literally could not get out of bed.
I basically burned out and broke down and I, at that same time, because I had put so much effort, you know, I had invested so much in this, this world view and this lifestyle, um, and when I was realizing that the results were not really um, any good at all, I, they really, the whole patriarchy thing really ruined my relationship with my husband. My kids were not thriving. They were not doing well at all because there was so much isolation and we were failing in the homeschooling because we just couldn't keep up with everything. Uh, and they were, they were all fairly miserable. And I was looking at what was happening and I'm thinking, for all of this effort, it seems like things should be going better. And it caused me to really reevaluate what we were doing and why we were doing it. And after a while, I came to the point where I realized that it was this fundamentalism that was really tripping us up, that was a real problem. And I got to the point where I no longer believed enough of the Bible and, and Jesus to actually consider myself a Christian. I got a divorce. I put all my kids into public school. And, uh, and it was later on, not too, not too long after that, that I encountered a book called Quiverful, which is written by Catherine Joyce. She is a, a secular journalist from New York. And she had been on some completely unrelated assignment and had come across these women who were dressing very modestly in these jean jumpers and they had head coverings and just a passel of children and homeschooling them all. And she was looking at these people and saying, what is this? Why are you living this way in this day and age where you know we don't have to do that anymore? She is the one who named the movement Quiverful because, I mean, everybody who does it, they just call themselves Christians, biblical Christians. And so nobody who um, is actually living that lifestyle accepts that term Quiverful. The Duggars, they insist that they are not Quiverful. They are so Quiverful. <laughs> but they would never call themselves that. The Duggar family, they um, are made famous by a reality TV program that they uh, are on called 19 Kids and Counting. Started out, I believe, 14 and pregnant again. That's when I encountered Michelle Duggar. I saw her on television and I was just in awe. I thought, here's a woman who is actually doing it. She's got all these kids. She's got, you know, the organization and the, just the way that her children were presented on camera. They were so respectful. They were so obedient. They were so, um, you know, just the epitome of what we were striving for in our home, which was not working out nearly so well. I'm, you know, glad that nobody brought a camera in <laughs> to see what was going on there. We were trying, we tried really hard, but it was just way too much to keep up with. You know, there's no reality involved in there. It's just a big head trip in which everybody is trying to fit into these roles and you have to really, you know, um, do some pretty, pretty convoluted mental gymnastics to be able to follow those biblical gender roles in today's society. And uh, so it, it ends up, everybody is just miserable. Everybody is so fake because you can't be who you are. Forget about your, you know, capitalizing on your strengths, minimizing weaknesses. You basically just have to fit into that box. And it's, it's very confining, it's very restrictive. And the only way to keep it up is to keep up the delusion that's making you believe that this is actually, you know, God's will. Well, what happened is um, In Touch Weekly magazine released a, a police report that showed that in 2002-2003, their oldest son, Josh Duggar, uh, molested five girls over a, a course of a couple of years. And so when that 
information came out in public, and it's kind of been floating around rumors of that on the internet um, for as long as they have been in the public eye. But now that it's come out, full-blown story, and uh, it's been, you know, just crazy. You, you go to the news feeds, and that's all you hear about. They handled it biblically because within that fundamentalist mindset, you know, there's this belief that there are channels of authority that God works through. And right at the very top under God is the family. The family is ultimate. And of course, the husband, the father is the ultimate authority within that system. So they would try to handle this as a sin issue, as a character issue, and, you know, they did all of that. The next step, the Bible says, is you would go to the elders of the church, which he also did. Uh, Jim Bob took his son to the elders. And even then, you know, it was not a matter of contacting authorities because it's still a, a sin issue. It's something that needs to be dealt with spiritually rather than legally or psychologically or any of that. Within the Christian homeschooling, and, and I have to qualify that and say fundamentalist Christian homeschooling, there is like a stark terror of CPS, Child Protective Services. And uh, so, you know, they believe that social workers just want to steal your children, take them away and put them, you know, in an ungodly environment. And so they would not have wanted to have that involvement in their home. When you, you, you go down that path and you have all of these children and you just take a look and say, how are they doing? You know, how's it working out for you? And uh, that has been the thing that I find with No Longer Quivering, that the women who come and they start reading, their main concern is, you know, my kids, I'm doing this for my kids and it's not helping them, it's actually hurting them. And that's the motivation that they have. The same thing that got them into it is what's gonna get them out of it. My life is real. <laughs> I don't have this whole buffer and this filter of, you know, imaginary bullshit that is uh, driving all of my decisions. And so, you know, it's not perfect. My kids are not perfect, uh, but that's all right because now I can look at things not like I wish they were or like, you know, I'm hoping that they are or whatever God can do with this situation, not through all of that, but I can just look at how it actually is and make choices and decisions based on that. And I am, you know, literally loving my kids way more now than I ever did when I had to control every little detail of their lives. Now they can just be whoever they are and it's awesome. My kids are awesome. They're really smart. They are very um, creative. <laughs> they get in trouble but it's almost you know part of the fun because I get to see them grow up. I get to see them make decisions, learning life lessons and and I don't have to you know, force some predetermined outcome or this is who you have to be. They, they get to make up their own lives and it's cool, it's really cool.